this up because Sheriff Patrol boat arrived within three minutes. Two nurses were next door, and they were there before the Sheriff Patrol boat arrived. But there's only one thing we can do to help in a situation like that, and that is an AED. Sheriff Patrol didn't have one on his boat. So, folks, um, you probably do have one already, two of them. But definitely that's the only thing, and we've got a very narrow time frame. If, some of, if somebody gets in the water here and gets shocked, uh, depending on the water temperature, depending on the temperature, you got maybe five minutes to get that administered. And it's not a guarantee, but it's the only hope that we've got. So I just really encourage yacht clubs to have them. Yes, sir. We're, we're salt water here. Yep. Yep. And? I don't know of any reported cases where electric shock drowning has happened in salt water. Yep, I'm with you on that. Why would that be? But let's have that conversation. I've been waiting for that question. I thought you were going to do it a little earlier. <laughs> not you, because, but. Because your body conducts current better than fresh water. And salt water conducts current almost exactly the same as your body. And why is that? Salt content. Salt content. In fact, our salt content is precisely the same as the ancient ocean. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, is that to say that we shouldn't be concerned about this in salt water? No. Okay. So, let me go on and explain that a little further because there's a lot of people that have this uh, this thing. They're going, oh, this is salt water. We don't have to worry about this in salt water. Well, there's that, but more importantly than that, and, and I believe that there are some cases that are so Did you repeat your question, Bill? Oh, I'm sorry. The question was? Repeat the question that you asked him. Who asked him? Nobody did. I'll tell you what he said. He goes, this is salt water. So really, if we look at it this way, the question would be, the question <coughs> at hand that always comes up is, what about salt water? Because, you know, our water, our water and our bodies which is most of our body, is precisely the same as ancient oceans. We're very saline, and that's why when you get in a voltage gradient in the fresh water, you are more conductive than the water around you. So that's great. You can say, hey, we're in salt water, so we don't have to worry about this. Okay. Um, I disagree with that, because what happens when it rains? Mm -hmm. well, it does what? Change the slant. Not only that, it stratifies. Mm -hmm. Okay? So for a period of time, as it rains, you're going to have a layer of what kind of water on top of the salt water? Fresh water. And that is going to be there. So with this in mind, I was up teaching at Kodiak College on Kodiak Island. Do you know where that is? Is that in the middle of the ocean? Is that salt water? Absolutely. And I had a bunch of NOAA uh, biologists with me, and they happen to have a lot of really expensive equipment. Really nice equipment, and they have a great salinity meter. And these folks are in my class, and I said, hey, volts per foot is going to be safe and isn't. And I, I uh, would encourage us at some point, well, probably can't do it tonight, but grab a bucket of your salt water, top, pop it in my tub right here, and see what happens and see what that voltage gradient actually materializes to be, even in salt water. So, uh, hey, hey, when you guys freeze around here, have you ever noticed I can talk about Port Ludlow for sure, it's not too far from here, but what happens in the winter time? Ice on the surface. We get ice on the surface, so what does that mean to you? We got fresh water on the surface, and it's all over the place. So it is, it is even though you can say reasonably that it's less likely, you're not eliminating this entirely in salt water at all. And so, and uh, a lot of folks have looked at this for a lot of years and came down National Electric Code, of course, NEC 555.3, and there's a bunch of others now too associated. First came down from NFPA 303, but uh, ground fault protection is a reality now. And do you want, you know, do you know what happens when your neighbor, let's talk about your neighbor for a second. Not trying to encourage any of this behavior. But do you know what happens if your neighbor's leaking electricity? Do you have a good safety ground on your boat? You conduct it ashore. You conduct it back to the transformer. Because that's one of the things that we should talk about is current always returns from 
whence it came. It's got to go where it came from. It goes back there, okay? And so when you get out here, you can look, where's the transformer on this dock? Because that's where this is going to need to go back to. Unless, of course, you put a transformer on your vessel. And that's a whole other thing coming up. I want to get to that real quick, and I want to answer some more questions if I can. Typical scenario, victim enters the water, becomes disabled, may or may not call for help. Hey, if the gradient is such, you can have it to the point where it doesn't take very much, where you're, you know, basically your diaphragm is completely paralyzed. So you're not even going to be able to call, take a breath, anything, right, with your diaphragm paralyzed. Uh, rescuers may unable may be unable help to do to feeling electrical shock themselves, and of course the victim's situation may worsen while seeking a safe haven. Ken Lutrick, for example, he's feeling some tingling, and right in front of him is a ladder, and of course, unfortunately, it was the very boat that was leaking. Okay, and so that's often the case. What are you going to do if you're in the water? All of a sudden, you feel tingling. You want to get out of that water. Right? Just as quick as you can. And I'm going to tell you, that's probably the wrong thing to do. I would go away from the furthest electricity that you possibly can, right? Okay. Um, let's, let's kind of speed this up. But in order to have this failure, you've got to have a, a lack or failure in the AC grounding slash bonding system. And I say that just because what we call grounding on a boat and on land or bonding, these are all two different things. And I want to use that same, you know, I just want to cover all bases here. A bonding system on a boat is very different than bonding on land, okay? Second, we have to have an electrical fault. Low water conductivity is really where this is the most dangerous. And we can say, hey, this water conductivity right now was, I don't know, when was the last time it rained? Um, we can check that out and find out what it is. But what's key here is this two volts per foot is what's considered lethal. Two volts. That means if I take a, a meter and I put my test lead here and I put it here, a foot apart, and I get more than two volts, that is enough to cause skeletal muscular paralysis. And we're going to do that here in a few minutes. And, and this should make you a little nervous when I got, you know, AC going to the water and coming back out here and all this kind of stuff. But I want you to visualize this and see this. It'll stick with you, I promise you. Okay? Okay, well, it's very quick. This is getting technical. I hope I don't lose y'all. But we're going to call this a water heater on a boat, right? Okay, and I got my hot conductor, also referred to as the ungrounded. Um, and we get our neutral. That's typically white, but I got a white background, so it's blue. Are you okay? All right. And I got, of course, my AC safety ground, which is green. Now, here is my hot conductor coming aboard my boat. And... When I installed this battery, uh, excuse me, water heater, somehow I didn't quite seat that grommet in very well, or maybe whoever did this, because I hope I would never do such a thing. But uh, basically, this wire starts to chafe. And when it makes contact to the case of this water heater or any other device, what's going to happen? Here's the good news. Wanna, go ahead. Yeah, in this case, we're grounded. So what's, what does that mean, though? Let's, let's make sure everybody gets that, right? So this green wire is also connected to this case. In fact, this green wire isn't part of the circuit at all. If I remove that green wire, would my water heater work? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, no problem. But when this wire chafes, because can I, is it fair to say that what's in here is a giant resistor? Right? Okay? It's resisting the flow of electrons, okay? Um, this, is there a resistor in here? We certainly hope not, because that's its function in life. Okay, so when this chafes on here, it gives it a zero resistance pathway all the way back to our neutral ground connection at the source of power, and that causes a breaker to trip. Everybody go with that? Okay? So, and that's all over the place. And on a boat, we even tie our DC negative to this AC safety ground so that anything in our boat that we can touch is going to be safe. I, had a, I got a call here a couple years ago, terrible with time, maybe it's three, four years ago from the Coast Guard saying, we need you to Lake Powell again, Kevin. We've got another, this is a really weird one, 35-year-old, 
firefighter, San Bernardino fireman who was brutally electrocuted in front of his family. It wasn't properly, there was not a safety ground where it should have been, I'll just say that. You can look that up, just Google that. There was a thousand people at his funeral, it was a big deal, it was terrible. Okay, safety ground, we understand now that our AC safety ground, not only is it goes back and connect to the neutral at the source of power, not on the boat, no neutral ground connections on the boat. There are three exceptions to that, but let me say that again, no neutral ground connections on the boat. There are three exceptions. Where are they? Andy, can I put you on the spot? You can put me on the spot there. Probably okay, I won't. No, I'll, I'll, I'll probably get one. You'll get it. Um, yeah. Let me say this. They're all newly derived sources of power. Yeah, isolation, generator. isolation transformer, secondary side. Where else? Generator. Generator. Yeah. One more place. Inverter. Inverter when it's in invert mode. And only when it's in burnt mode, not when it's in battery charger mode. This is a relay that opens and closes, right? Okay, <coughs> so we have this connection here to our DC negative, so that if one of these hot wires is inside your boat, chafes on your through hull or something like that, that it's going to pop the breaker instead of you being able to climb down like the 35 year old firefighter I just talked about, just doing some maintenance and was electrocuted. We want to prevent that from happening, yes? You should be able to go in your engine room with confidence that you are not going to get electrocuted. And you accomplish that by following the standards, making sure you have an ELCI and all those different things. I'll touch on the ELCI soon. What happens when I don't have uh, this connection? Goes to sea water. Goes to what? Goes to the sea water. To okay, great. Or fresh water close to the water. So here we go. What's going to stop this? How do you know that this is happening? You don't. Is there any visual indication? None. Is, is there any audible indication? None. Can I, and, and I, what can I, is there anything to see? We're going to do this in this tub and you'll see there's no way for you to know that there is current in the water unless you have equipment to measure it, right? So this is, your water heater, by the way, is gonna work just fine, right? Your electric bill may go up, right? But unless somebody comes along, everything's gonna work just fine. You're not gonna know that this exists. The only pathway for this to return of the current on this case now is gonna be through the water through the land back up to that ground state that's at the transformer, okay? Lack of safety ground is the one consistent fault in all electrocutions, right? If there, was no, if there was a safety ground, we wouldn't have these problems. Why would we not have a safety ground? Well, I mentioned earlier that we heard about a gentleman that understood somehow, actually, if you go back far enough, um, the Power Squadron even published an article saying, cut your AC safety ground to prevent corrosion on your boat. Now they're not proud of that, and that was way a lot of years ago. But there was an article talking about that, because I gotta say this, your AC safety ground, the minute you plug into the marina, unless you have a galvanic isolator or an isolation transformer, you are connecting all of your underwater metals your neighbors, and your neighbor's neighbor, and their neighbor, and everybody else is on that bonding system. Don't get any ideas. Do not cut that green wire. <laughs> okay? Um, you create a galvanic cell and when you plug in, unless you have an isolation or galvanic isolator. You need an anode, cathode, metallic path for electrons, well, common electrolyte, and you will have galvanic corrosion. Yes, sir? How about solar panels? Because there's only two wires on the solar panel. They're not grounded. They're supposed to be. If it's a metal case, it's supposed to be grounded. Yeah, look at National Electric Code and uh, NFPA, it's all because of fire and stuff like that, yeah. I have a 5.2 kilowatt solar array at our home down in near Portland and everything's grounded, you know. But on flexible panels, there's no- No, they just have, but it's non-conductive, that's the difference. Oh. That's the difference there, yeah. This, this particular case here, you see this? 
What's going on here? The safety ground was cut. Why would the safety ground be cut? Because he heard about corrosion. He thought, sure enough, this is where I'm going to lose my propeller. And there is some truth to that, but that's not how we do this. Okay, we can take care of this with a, a galvanic isolator isolation transfer. And make sure if you're putting a galvanic isolator on your boat that it is fail safe. A fail safe galvanic isolator. Because a, a galvanic isolator comprises of four diodes and a capacitor. And do diodes fail? Yes. And can they fail closed? Yes. Can they fail open? Yes. If they fail open, you lose your AC safety ground. We're now in trouble. In this case, there was six women in the water. And the um, uh, good news is nobody died, but uh, this was cut for that reason. And um, basically, the, one of the family members went up to the front of the boat, all the women are in the water, and he stands at this one spot. Everybody starts screaming. And so the, I was unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever, however you want to look at it, on another investigation. And it was in Tennessee. And so Dennis Bono went and did this one. and. Um, he called me up and said, I cannot, I found the first fault, but it takes two faults. That one was easy. Couldn't find the second one. And then a law enforcement officer went and stood at that same place where the family member had been standing. And all of a sudden, his continuity meter went beep, you know. And so basically, the deck was oil canning a little bit. Are you with me when I say oil canning? It's pushing down a little bit. And, and the builder had put the AC conductors right under the deck and there was a fuel tank right under there every time you push that it was like putting on a switch huh. and turning that on and off and so when everybody starts screaming he going to help turned off the switch and uh, the good news was that grandma uh, was uh, in real trouble but they were able to defibrillate her and she survived <coughs> what about this <laughs> we can spend a lot of time we don't have a lot of time but neutral ground connections all over the place, and then the grounding conductor coming from short cut and taped off uh, nicely with green electrical tape. <coughs> uh, mechanisms for mortality, basically direct contact, electrocution death, voltage gradient, electrocution death, or voltage gradient, paralysis, grounding, and death. Those are the three ways basically this stuff is occurring, and it's occurring much more than any of us know because there is no post-mortem evidence whatsoever that electricity is involved in this. It's just another strange grounding. None. And I've been working on this for 22 years, and there is, I mean, I get doctors, certainly there's some, and they go back and do some checking. We've got doctors been on our board and what have you. There's no post-mortem evidence, folks. And so there's only, the only time we find this, if it so far has been another victim in the water, okay, that has come back and said, I felt some tingling, I got shocked, or something like that. So um, just, we don't know how many times this really happens at all. We believe we're capturing just the tip of the iceberg with this. Uh, testing in hundreds of marinas across the country showed all marinas having some AC leakage. All marinas. I have been to hundreds uh, all over the country, and I have never been in a marina that I haven't detected AC in the water. Factors determine electric shock. I'm going to bypass this just because I'm running. There's a lot of things that can affect how much shock you're going to get. Let's go to this one, because this is where it gets kind of important. How many milliamps does it take to make one amp? A thousand. A thousand. Okay. One to three milliamps. One to three, tingling sensation. If that's traveling through the human body, you're gonna feel this, one to three milliamps. 10 to 20, loss of voluntary muscle control. 10 to 20 milliamps, okay? 18 to 22, can't breathe, paralysis of the diaphragm and chest muscles. Milliamps, okay? Uh, 50 to 65, heart fibrillation can become fail. 100 plus deadly life, uh, death can occur within a very few seconds. 200 plus is immediate cardiac immobilization, instant death. At 200 milliamps, I'm just getting a 60 watt bulb to glow. Just to give you a comparison here. Does that make sense? Yes. Is there a difference for a child versus an adult for those numbers? Yeah, there is. Um, and women and men, there's a difference there too. 
Um, men's back seems to be not quite as conductive for whatever reason. And uh, children seem to be uh, a little bit more susceptible. Um, I guess our men's skin is a little, no, it's not skin, it's the fat. I think we're just a little meaner or something, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just the fat that is different there. And I'm certainly not a doctor or an expert on any of that. So, so let's real quick talk about detecting this. And, uh, oh yes, real quick. What effect of the diving suit, wet suit or dry suit on this? Uh-huh. So the material is a dielectric. It is, yeah. Have any of you worn a, uh, you know, a dry suit or a, a wet suit? Yes. Of course. The good news is that is non-conductive. And so we've got, we do have cases with divers in wetsuits, unfortunately, being electrocuted. Uh, but the vast majority of the time, you are very well protected from this. It just depends on your orientation, like if you have gloves on or you don't, or a hoodie or not. Um, uh, I've worked with a variety of dive teams, uh, including the FBI dive team, on these issues and to try to discern what they can do to keep themselves safe. And this is what it comes down to. Turn off the power. Mm -hmm. Turn off the power. And of course, I hear this all the time. Oh, my, what about all the divers that are out diving all around? If they're a smart diver, they're turning off the power, <laughs> at least to the boats in the area that they're diving in. And uh, they're wearing a complete wet and or dry suit. Okay. My suggestion, let's put a, some tape of uh, carbon fiber in the zippers here or something like that to uh, alleviate the gradient across the, mm. the body, right? Somebody should just take that and run with it, make a lot of money. So anyway, good question. Uh, clamping a shore power cord. So I'm just gonna move fast here. Let's go right to here. Okay, here's the deal. That one's leaking 17.37 uh, amps. And I am clamping, in this case, around uh, just the, right now, I'm clamping just around the entire conductor. That's not what I recommend, um, but that's a lot of times where we end up starting, okay? So, let me tell you a few things, and maybe you can answer this. As electrons move down a conductor, they do what? They create a magnetic field, okay? That's really cool because we can measure magnetic fields. And of course, we have Let's just talk about a 30 amp, 120 volt system. You got three wires in it. You got hot, neutral, and ground, or technical terms, ungrounded, grounded, and grounding. As the current goes in, and we're not gonna, I'm not gonna spend time about the fact nature of AC hopping back and forth. Let's just look at it as, because most people understand DC. You've got the hot wire, and you got the negative wire. Hot, neutral. Current's gonna run down and come back out current is not consumed. So the current that's going in should be coming back out the intended conductors. Everybody with me on that? Yep. So uh, the interesting thing about this magnetic field is as it's going on what I call the Gazinski, it's twirling this way. And when it comes out the Kazowski, it's going the opposite direction. Those two magnetic fields cancel each other out perfectly as long as they are precisely the same. And if everything's appropriate on the boat, they will be precisely the same. Because don't make the mistake that it's consumed on the boat. It's just simply passing through. The electric company measures how much current is passing through. They're getting a lot of money for that when you think about it. Anyway, so a clamp meter like this, all it can do is measure a magnetic field. And I don't recommend people clamp the whole shore power cord because you're going to be clamping something that's not going to help you out much, and that's the AC safety ground. So let's take a look here. I find 17.37 amps on this cord. Let's put break out our split cord. Okay, NEMA L530 for this is that's what they call that type of plug. Okay, for 30 amp 120, and I'm going to put that in there, and I'm going to measure just the hot. So I got 16.42 amps coming in the hot. And if everything's good, how much should be coming out the neutral? Okay, 16.42, you all get an A. All right. Whoops, I got 0 
wow, how much is going to be on the AC safety ground? All the rest, yeah. Point oh nine. Folks, where is this energy going? It's going into the water. That's bad. That's bad. Okay, so we go and I you know get the harbor master and we get the find a captain, pull him out of the bar. It's a fish boat. <laughs> and you know, I ask him, is there anything going on in the boat? No, oh, my boat's perfect, been this way for 30 years. <laughs> you don't even look 30 years old. Well, you know. Okay, so we get aboard the boat. Here's the panels. Let's take a little closer look. Those of you that are electrician in here, okay, let's just go through this. Here's our hot conductor. It comes up here, but what's this? That's another hot conductor bypassing the breaker. Okay, so there is no breaker, right? It's being bypassed. Uh, let's look at the safety ground. Comes up here, it lands here, it goes through here, and uh, gets cut off. It gets cut. Anyway, there are, they're all over the place. There are safety grounds, but they're cut. Look at the neutral wire. Tell me what it's attached to. Nothing. The case. Nothing. No. Absolutely nothing. There is no neutral on this boat. So how is it working? Because all the AC is coming on. It's all going through the water. So we're on a travel lift here. We got straps around the boat, right? We're still plugged in. We lift it up. It's going to go. We lower it back down the water. The minute any piece of metal hits our, they'll start back up again, right? And this guy goes, I said, really? There's, you've noticed nothing? He goes, well, I do go through a lot of anodes. <laughs> OK, how many anodes? This is a wood boat, three through holes, a single, single um, shaft and propeller. He goes, oh, about 35 pounds a year. Anybody know anything about wood boats? Any other wood boat would be completely destroyed with 35 pounds due to delignification would have been done. And he goes, yeah, it's a real bummer because I have to take it to Astoria up the Columbia River. And I said, oh my God, do you plug in up there? And he goes, no, their electrical system sucks. <laughs> Why does their electrical system suck? It's not very conductive compared to what it's usually in. Okay, fun times, 4.7 amps, uh, 72 milliamps. 6.53, and on and on we go. Uh, shall we say 6,650 milliamps? Okay, because that's really what we're talking about. So the clamp meter, yeah, basically remember what goes in must come out, and it should be balanced. So let's get through some of this and get down to, um, now I wanted to, remember I said I wish that I had tested to see if there was an AC, what's that? Oh, I was wanting to ask you about that meter right there. Well, that's one. I actually refer my students um, to this device, which is the same thing. It's called a circuit analyzer, but it's really cool because it has blue and red screens. It has National Electric Code programmed in here, okay, and if it's not good, it's going to go red screen. So you can send anybody out, mm. almost anybody out with this, and have them come back and tell you, hey, I got a red screen. Right? So, and then it's time to investigate and see what's going on. But this device will tell, if, tell you whether or not we have a, an appropriate AC safety ground. Unlike the three prong, or the three LEDs you get at Home Depot, mm -hmm. you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. A lot of times they have a tested GFCI button. Those are for terrestrial use only. It's, we don't have time to go into that, but that should be used on a house not on a boat. This is the, this will appropriately, these type of devices will work on a boat. Okay, is everybody good with the fact that current going in is creating a magnetic field this way, coming back out this way? And so what do we want to capture here? Um, when we're clamping these short power cords, you want to be putting in a split cord because if you go around the entire cord, you're going to be going around the AC safety ground as well. The problem with the AC safety, it's a good wire, don't pull it out, it's gotta be there. It is connected to all your underwater metals. And if there's any leakage anywhere else in the marina, 
there's a good chance that your underwater metals through hull will be used as a return path. And so if you want to know about your boat, you need to use a split cord. And you're going to clamp around the hot and the neutral only. And then you're going to need to energize every AC circuit in that boat. Not just turn the breakers on. You need to do more than that. You need to exercise all of that equipment while monitoring neutral and ground, okay? A little bit of a tedious process, but uh, I guarantee you it's worth it. Okay, this boat right here is leaking 89 volts a foot from the propeller, and here it is on my, you all carry a portable oscilloscope with you, I'm sure, like I do, and there you go. So once we get this, you can see the perfect 60 hertz <laughs> right here, and a perfect sine wave, and... Uh, Time of day stamp, and uh, yeah, this boat even had 24 volts on the stanchions. So I, I may or may not have mentioned to you that uh, a number of years ago, when we first started recognizing this, Coast Guard said we should do something about this, offered a grant, I was involved with that. We went around energizing boats all over the country, and uh, different bodies of water, different boats, different sizes and types, and came up with a a uh, document that's available from the U.S. Coast Guard Office of Boating Safety should be free to you. You call them up, say, I'm a boater, I want to get a copy of this. My, I mean, if you have insomnia, I promise it will help <laughs> because it's just raw data, but the data is there. So we energized boats and measured all over the place. And this was one of the rigs that we used. And we set it up so that we could measure voltage gradients and articulate it so we could get the different directions. Anyway, all that data is there. Prevention on the dock side. <coughs> NFPA 303, NAC 555, 555.3, uh, more things. Basically requiring uh, ground fault protection uh, at the head of the dock at 100 milliamps and uh, each individual pedestal 30 milliamps. Okay, 30 milliamps is what, we're, what they've decided is going to be okay. By the way, <coughs> Imagine how I felt day three, post Lucas being killed, that I found out that Europe has ground fault protection at every marina all over the place. They have 30 milliamp ground fault protection. And so I found that out about two or three days after Lucas was killed. She said, how is it that their electrical system is safer than ours. Mm. That's where the 30 milliamps came from, by the way, but they'll never admit to it because they won't. Okay, what do you think? Does this look okay, folks? If you walk in your marina or anybody else and you see something like that, is that okay? Mm, no. How about this one? Okay, this was interesting. I, this was a day I had four different fire departments. I'm doing some training. I'm gonna go down on this dock. They were the AHJ, the authority having jurisdiction. I didn't even know they were the AHJ for that. In other words, they're responsible for that dock. <coughs> and um, what do you see here? A meter. That's a meter base. Guess what? Do we have voltage there? Yeah, it's live. And the meter went bloop, bloop, bloop. Nobody knows. That's, that's sitting at what, well, you can see their knees. That's the height of that. All you have to do is go in there and touch that. Right? Not a good scenario. Uh, I found touch hazards all over this particular marina on that day. And it just, it's just kind of scary when you look at this stuff. Look at this pedestal here. So when you look at your marina, you can go, wow, I, don't, I, I haven't been in your marina, but I don't see things, you know, I can't see from here, but I doubt we have things like this, right? So that's great. <clears throat> What's wrong with that one? What happens when that thing shorts through? <laughs> the entire roof and all the structure, the stanchions holding this up and everything, okay? So, um, yeah. Prevention on the boat side. ABYC standards, correct polarity, resistance, bonding, wire integrity, separation of AC and DC, AC safety ground, DC bonding connection, the use of an isolation transformer. Yes, sir. Uh, I've heard that you can miswire those. That there may have been an isolation transformer wired incorrectly in our vicinity. 
Okay, well, you need to have um, qualified people. Not here. Okay, just in our vicinity. Yeah, yeah there may be. Um, yeah, they can be miswired. You need to have people that know what they're doing um, to wire them for you. And I guess the first place to start is make sure um, that whoever's doing this type of work for you has at least, at minimum, an ABYC electrical certification, I would say. And, um, and then uh, you might ask them how many transformers. I mean, it, it's not complicated once you know what to do. But now, like the new ones that we're getting are even more complicated because the directions suck. Right? So, yeah. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> my, I've been talking all day, so please forgive my coughing here. Running out of it. Here's an isolation transformer. Let's just put it this way. Source of power now moves to your vessel. So it no longer needs to leak out of your vessel to go all the way back to the transformer on the dock or on shore. Therefore, it will not leave the boat to go up and do that. It does a lot of other wonderful things for you that we don't have time to go into, but I'm a huge proponent of isolation transformer. In fact, when I sat on the, on the committee meeting there at, uh, the, uh, at ABYC, when, when the ELCI came into existence. Do you all know what an ELCI is? It's coming mm -hmm. right up. Equipment leakage circuit interrupter. And it trips at 30 milliamps in 100 seconds. It's a ground fault protection device like your GFCI in your kitchen, in your bathrooms, in your garages, and outside. But it's designed for the whole boat to prevent this type of stuff from happening. I wanted isolation transformers. The electrical engineers in the room saw a great product they could make, which is now called an ELCI. They want, OK? I was happy that they did something. So there we go. Here's the ELCI in Cheryl's beautiful hands. And uh, basically, it's required on all boats with a C system. And it's a ground fault protection device. By the way, it works just like this does. And just like the GFCI in your house. OK? And there's the, there's the donut, what we call the donut in the field. Our current transformer, CT, is what this is called. You run the hot and neutral through that conductor, and if there's any imbalance at 30 milliamps for 100 milliseconds, it will deprive the vessel of power and therefore keep you safe. Oh, points to remember. Let's just, let, here's a big one, no post-mortem evidence. Seawater is electrically 100 times more conductive. Um, AC must return, return uh, to its source. Uh, voltage gradients vary inversely to the surface area. What that means is on very large vessels, which is part of what makes this more insidious, okay, you with me on the word insidious, is that larger vessels, 70, about 77 feet and above, can have full line voltage on their hull, but because it's such a big electrode in the water, it's not developing these lethal gradients that can affect you and I. If we were couple hundred feet long, we might be in trouble. We would be in trouble, right? But it, you know, the average human being around six feet, it won't create that problem. Who's going swim in here? <laughs> After this presentation, you gonna swim in this spring now? <laughs> okay, then I, I can go home, because you should not be swimming in a marina. Now, what about this boat right out here? When I swim off a boat right out here, I would. I would, because if I have AC on that boat, where's it coming from? Coming from my boat. It's coming from a source on the boat, the generator, the inverter. And by the way, inverters will get you just as quick as anything else. Know that, okay? So uh, let's, uh, well here, a couple more things. We don't need to do that. We did create an association not to make any, we don't really hardly accept any money. It's just for education, period. And, um, there's a lot of folks. Uh, these guys here, they, I hope this is not real. But I think, it, I, I know look, that this guy's been drinking, because look at his face. I mean, there's here. So uh, anyway, flip-flops is not appropriate. You don't put, uh, you know, you don't put a power strip on flip-flops. <laughs> this is the study that we did. Um, it's called USCG Fiscal Year 2006 Grant and Water Shock Hazard Mitigation Strategies. And uh, thank you very much on that. So, would you all, I think there's, I know there's a lot of you, I was hoping, let's see if we can do this. 
Can we get you all to come up here around here? And I do need a volunteer. Let me move. You're done with this. Yeah, let me get that out of the way. And then I will answer some questions. Okay. I need you to run this. Okay. We're going to turn on high. And of course, you're going to stand by. We've already done that. Okay. So, down here, I've got extension cord. And basically, before I plug that in, what I've done is I took, I did not take Cheryl's hair dryer. I bought this at Walmart, okay? So I'm not in trouble with that. But what I did is I just took the two conductors and I split them, all right? And I set them up so I can plug this in and the hot comes in here and it goes in through here through the switch the load that i have here okay back out here into the water and then i took the neutral and i extended that out so it goes here so if you see when i turn this on here the only way that this is going to work is by forcing electricity through the water so what we can demonstrate here is a few things you'll be able to visualize voltage gradients now, what did I say was lethal voltage per foot? Are you all going to be able to see? Two. Two volts. Two volts per foot, okay? So, I need to ask you a question. When we turn this on, what's going to happen? Will it pop? Is there a break Ah, oh, I got a GFCI right here. So you think it's going to pop? Is this <laughs> fresh water? Is it this, yeah, this is, uh, well, clean fresh water, yes. no salt, no, <laughs> no salt, no nothing. Okay. It's fresh water right now. We're going to change that in a minute, but we're going to start with fresh water. Okay, so I'm going to plug this in, and you, he's running this for me, and we're off. Okay, that's not off. Off's in the middle. Off's in the middle. And this is high up here, and I want you to turn on the high as soon as I turn this on. Okay, so our first issue here is we're going to plug this in, and then we're going to turn it off. Leave it on. Yep, go ahead and turn it on. Now, if it does anything at all, I want you to tell me. Is it doing anything? Yeah. Not the thing. What do you all think? Move those closer together. Is closer. Is this not a conductor? No, no, no. This is press flash water. Okay, so do you think there's power in there? Yes. yes. Okay, so I'm going to take this LED light, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, I'm going to uh, put it in the water so that you can see these voltage gradients. Now, nobody put your fingers in here, okay? <laughs> and we're gonna see these voltage gradients because if I do this correctly and I go straight across here, I got one Gazinski and one Gazowski, so these gradients are stacking up this way. So if I do this right, I shouldn't be bridging any gradients, right? So let's give that a try, okay? Am I bridging a gradient? No. Now as I start to turn this just a little bit there, okay, just a little bit. Now I'll bring it back here, and if I keep it, so I come down here, and I can turn do the same thing here. Can you all see? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. super cool. And then I'm going to go over here, and then I'm going to go like this, okay. New dimmer switch. That's, well, <laughs> <laughs> you can use it as a dimmer switch. Okay, so there you go, all right. Now. How much voltage do we have here is the next question. You're going to keep hanging on to that. And you stand by if we need to shut it off for some reason. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to put this on uh, volts AC. Okay. And we said two volts per foot. Yes. So does that look like about a foot? Yep. Okay. Here we go. What do we got? 2.4. 24. 24.94. And this is where I'd like to get a bucket of your water out here and put it in here and see what happens. But uh, 24.94. Now, okay, so here we are at 24 volts. Now, watch this. I go like this. If I get it perfectly, now I'm 0.4 something. So if you can see these voltage gradients, watch this now. I'll get these really close together. Mm -hmm. And I got 0.7. Now, watch what happens as I just separate these out. 
Wow. Whoops, yeah. we just went, oh well. Okay, there's 12, 1, 16, 20, wow. 24, 25, 26, 20, 30, 40, 50. You get it closer here, get it closer here, there's 60. I get it even closer here. Okay, wow. and we're up there, there's 80. And I get even closer. Well, I'm not going to touch them, but we're at 96 right there. Wow. Okay, a couple things. Why did the GFCI not trip? GFCIs do not, that's a good thought, but GFCIs do not trip on current draw, right? They trip on an imbalance between the hot and the neutral, what's going in and what's going out. Do I have an imbalance here? I do not have an imbalance. Actually, even if I move these things around, I don't have an imbalance. Yeah. So, but we'll get into that again in a minute. Now, why is my hair dryer not working? I've heard you talk about this already because we don't have enough current. Yes. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna add some ions. We're gonna make this a little more conductive. Can you pass me that salt, sir? Thank you. Now, salt water, there's a lot more salt than we all of us she realize went, out there. Yes, I'm turning this in the meantime though because this is where it's kind of cool. All right, I'm gonna go like this. I'm gonna dump all of this water in here, although it's been a little, you know, it's obviously a little chunky, so it's been a little damp in Safeway or something. And, um, oh, we know what I didn't do? How much current? Should we check how much current's going in here? Mm -hmm. Let's do that. And you guys have one of these is why I grabbed it. Yes, we do. Okay, so I'm gonna stick this. Hey, by the way, any electrician in here, to, where do I need to put this? Doesn't matter. Okay, I'm gonna put it, oh shoot, what's going on over there? Be quiet. You're not supposed to do that yet. <laughs> not you. <laughs> the salinity's going up. The salinity's going up. We're getting some, so I've got, oh, I'm oh well. Okay, let's try this here. Okay, I got 600, um, well, what do I got? It looks like 1.6, well, it went up too fast. I should have put that on there before I started adding ions. But anyway, we're gonna add some more ions in here. Do you hear something? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not getting hot yet. No. I can't dry my hair if I had any yet. So don't get assaulted. <laughs> We're making this salt water now. So you hear that thing running now? Yeah. Okay, now don't do this with a metal spoon. All right? <laughs> Mix this up. <laughs> and Pretty tricky. Margaritas. <laughs> so is you, that in 100x or 50x? I don't know. Do we We're going to test it. We're going to see. So when I went like this with those with that meter and mm -hmm. voltage, what did we get? Do you remember? About 26, I think. Does that uh, sound about right? So let's try that again. And we're going to do it about one foot here. Now, oh, wait a minute. What do you expect? Is this voltage going to go up or go down? Down. 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 Yes, it's going to go down. I'm at 16 now. I put all that salt in there, awesome. and I'll be with you in a minute with that. We're going to finish this up here, so go ahead and set it down. Thank you. And so we're at 16. Um, so yeah, it went down. It didn't go down significantly, but it did go down. Okay. Okay. GFCI. Why did it not pop? Why is this working now? Because I've added enough ions that they they actually can move electricity through the water. Electrons travel through metal, ions through water. That's the way it is. When I add salt in there, we're making it more like so. We're making this a little bit safer. But I don't know. We're going to try your water here and see what it's like. But before I do that, let's go back to the question of why the DFCI didn't trip. No imbalance. No imbalance. Should we create an imbalance? Okay. <laughs> Just waiting for you to ask. Okay, here we go. So we're gonna basically, I'm getting a little too much. Can I hand that to you for a second? Mm -hmm. Hang on to that, because I'm getting all tangled up here. And I, boy, did I do it. There's this guy, his name is Murphy. He follows me around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Now, I'm going to need, oh, I do have an outlet right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dump this in the water. Okay, don't grab a hold of this. I mean, the metal part. 
So all I'm going to do now is I'm going to give basically without going too complicated here, the power's coming in here, it's going out there. Now in reality, it's going back and forth 60 times a second, right? But for our purposes, I got a Gazinski and I got a Gazowski. I'm going to give it another pathway. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen? Yeah, I'm just going to the grounding pin. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's, they don't work on overcurrent. That's a mistake that a lot of people make. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. it's an overcurrent protection device. No, mm -hmm. it's looking for that imbalance. All right, so let's see. We, we already measured the voltage. We saw that it diminished. Let's, uh, and we know the hair dryer is working. We understand the GFCIs and how that works now. And uh, did this make any difference for our this? No. Nope. I can still go like that. Now, can you kind of visualize these gradients? Yeah. yeah, as I go like that, we're crossing a bunch of gradients, and I'm like this, I'm not passing, crossing yeah. anything. So, um, let's dump this water out real quick and test your guys' water. Yeah. Big round of applause for Jerry. Good job. Way to go. All right. <laughs> Sorry. My volunteer, yep, we're still here. Let's make sure it's off. This got a little bit wet. So <laughs> I'm gonna be careful here. Do you want a, towel? Have a paper towel or something? Or a towel. Yeah. <laughs> there you do. Get a charge out of that. Okay, here we are. Be safe. <coughs> Plug this in. Okay, gonna reset that. Let me let's see here. Let me make sure we're good. We're reset. <coughs> All right. Hair dryer on. It's running. Let's see what that voltage gradient is. And who wants to read that for me? Can you read that for me while I do this? All right. I was wanting to watch out. And we're going to go roughly one foot there. 14.7. 14.7. What did we decide was lethal? Two. 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, do we need to worry about salt water? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think we do. <laughs> so I know, I know that Point. there's going to be, <laughs> as you folks, <laughs> you wouldn't have filled it with fresh water, did you? As you folks are implementing uh, NFPA 303 and 555, or, uh, it's NEC 555, there's going to be problems. There's no question. You're going to have boats that are not going to be able to have power. Let's find those issues and fix them. Right? Most of the time, the faults that cause this are neutral ground connections on a boat. Not in the three places that I talked about, but other places. And so places to be aware of. A lot of times household products that are designed for terrestrial use are brought aboard boats. And those devices will oftentimes have neutral ground connections. If I could draw this out for you right now, just picture the, the water heater that we had up there. That neutral and ground are connected together. That gives us an alternative pathway. Now you've all been told that electricity takes the path of that's only part of the picture, folks. It takes all conductive pathways back to its source. All conductive pathways. So when I go out to a boat and I clamp, all right, I clamp on the boat, I can actually discern if there's a neutral ground connection on the boat by, now I'm clamping, I don't want you to do this most of the time, but now I'm clamping the whole shore power cord and I'm going to have you get on, I'm going to have you turn circuit by circuit on. And if every time you turn a little, turn another circuit on, it goes up a little bit higher. Every single time, that's a guaranteed neutral ground connection. Again, is that turning on the circuit or? Turning on the devices. Yeah, yeah, a lot. Not, yeah, we got to have the devices. If you're just turning on the circuit breaker, nothing comes on, we're doing nothing. Yeah. That makes sense? So, questions? Can you tell, talk about the relative properties of a 
galvanic isolator and it's got a transformer? Sure. Galvanic isolator will block 1.4 volts DC. Why? Because it has diodes. Diodes have a voltage drop of 0.7 <coughs> volts across them. There's two in parallel, excuse me, two in series, and two go in series polarized this direction, two in series polarized the other direction, and a capacitor underneath. I'm picturing the diagram in my head. Mm -hmm. And a capacitor allows uh, AC to pass through where the and without turning off the diodes. Okay, so that is how that works. It, so it's supposed to block low level galvanic current. If you look at the galvanic series, series chart from the top and bottom, we got about 2.2 volts between the top and bottom of that chart. Now all this will block is 1.4, but for most of our metals out there, which is primarily stainless steel and bronze, uh, you're going to have some aluminum out there too. That's going to cover all that for us. But anything above 1.4 volts, well, 1.4 volts will be blocked. The rest will just pass on through, which is really bad because then we get straight current corrosion. Isolation transformer. Okay, the traditional isolation transformers, like a Charles unit, um, it's got a shield that sits in the, the three conductors come aboard. They go through their double pole breaker, ELCI, reverse polarity indicator. They'll go into the transformer. There always has to be a breaker, double pole breaker on the primary side of that transformer, period. Okay? You may not have to have an ELCI if that's located within 10 feet, but I'm getting a little too complicated here. So those three conductors come in. They go into the primary side of the transformer. AC safety ground lands on a 4,000 volt shield. In other words, a shield that sits between primary and secondary windings that's rated for 4,000 volts. Why do we need 4,000 volts? Lightning strikes. So that's where that sits. It isn't connected anywhere else on the boat. If there's a fault between primary and secondary for some reason, it'll clear that fault for us. But it does not come, it does not go any further. It stops right there. You got hot, neutral, and ground that goes to the shield. Secondary side of the transformer. So you've got hot and neutral that come out of that. We create our own safety ground coming out of the secondary by connecting neutral and ground together at the secondary side of that transformer. And now you have basically, because how this works is through the mag, uh, you know, what I call magic of magnetic induction. I do think it's magic, it's so cool. Basically the energy on the primary side is running through and there's creating the same magnetic field that we keep talking about it goes across because we've got a nice piece of iron in there, you know, an iron core, and it sends it across the magnetic field, which causes the electrons on the secondary side to start moving and do their thing. So we get electricity on the secondary side on our boats with no physical connection whatsoever to shore or anybody else's boat, yeah. which is very relevant, right? So that's the difference.